Everybody ready? Y'all ready? So I sent out the, uh, a quiz last night Did, that's due today. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Five minutes, five minutes ago, I sent a quiz that's due right now. No. No. Uh, I hope that you uh, were able to attempt your homework. Um, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to questions on it in just a second. Um, I did grade both of your quizzes, and I posted the grades. I don't know if they're showing up. In one of my other classes, both the quiz grades show up? Okay. You just checked it recently? Okay. So you should be able to get to your grades, but I'll pass these back. Um, let me make sure this audio is working. Okay. I did have a student tell me that they're, they're having issues with uh, when they log into ACES and click on the class, it's not bringing up the Canvas. Did, you, did it work afterward or? You know what you, what you can do is you, when you get to our Canvas page, you can copy the URL and save it. And then when you click on it, it'll prompt you for your ACES login, but it'll take you straight to the course. Okay, um, so a few other students have had the same issue. And, and uh, what did y'all do? Just you waited and it worked. What browser were you using? Do you know? Okay, so I don't know. Um, try a different browser. That's what I would do. Just try a different browser. See, it's been there's been all sorts of problems. I can't even get to my email, like at my workstation, in my office. I can't get to my email. So, in structure, yeah. I think the people who are hacking the system know a little bit more about the people who are trying to protect it because they're whatever they're doing they're doing a good job of messing it up all right so the here's the thing about the quizzes um i'm gonna pass these back y'all want them now or now normally i i would just pass the stack around and let you pull yours out um, but some people might not like the idea of their grade being seen by other people. So we're just going to take a vote. It's okay if you don't want yours passed around. So how many of you are not okay with me passing them around as a stack? Everyone's okay? Okay, so I'm, there's two stacks. So, well, there's, there's two quizzes in here. All right, two quizzes in here, so make sure you go through the entire stack. Quiz ones are in the front, quiz twos are in the back. Now, while these are going around, I'm going to talk a little bit about these, all right? Both of the solutions for these quizzes are posted in our Canvas website. If you click on Files, Solutions, I have it broken up now to Quizzes and Homework. Click on Quizzes, it brings up the answers to both of these. The way that you should do it is you should get your quiz back, you should go look at the answers, and you should compare. Because when I take off on things, sometimes I'm not real explicit on, I'm taking off seven points because of this. With, with, especially like on quiz two, I'm looking just for like overall, like this is, this is like a 60, you know? And if you want to come talk to me about how I came up with 60, we can sit down and talk, all right? Um, on quiz two, no, I'll start with one. Quiz one, it was uh, numbers one and two, right? And number one had a couple of parts. Number two had a couple of parts. And I counted each part as 20% for the whole quiz. So it was, it was five parts total, 20% each. That's the way it worked. On the second quiz, there were two problems. They were each 50%, 50-50. So if you did problem, if you did quiz two and you did problem one, but you skipped quit number two, you got 50 points off. But I think that that's a little unfair. So if you feel like on number two, you did one, you did one, you didn't get to two or whatever, you're going to have to come talk to me on, on office hours 
And we can talk about me kind of changing the rubric of how I graded that. But you have to engage me for that. As it is right now, it was 50-50. Okay? Questions on that? Uh, I don't have the averages. I, I could look them up, but I'm not going to. My feeling is that the, the averages, there's a lot of low grades in there. On the first one with the circle, what I saw was a lot of people thought that they were doing it right, but it wasn't right. Like a lot of people came out with one half AB sine theta, but they never realized that A and B are one and that theta is something you can determine. So yes, you kind of got somewhat there, but not close to where you needed to go. And then at the very last part of, of problem number one, or quiz one was where you had to let n go to infinity. A lot of people didn't do that. So I'm open to discussion on any of these quizzes. You want to talk about it, you can sit down with me in my office. We can go through it. Sometimes you can get a couple extra points that way if you can explain to me what you were doing. Neatness. Um, I know this is not a penmanship class, but you need to work on your neatness, especially, you know, engineers, you want to do, you've got to start to be able to organize your ideas on paper legibly so someone can understand them. Okay, you may understand it, great, but if I look at it and I'm like, what are you doing? Then there need, you need to work on that communication. A lot of you are doing real well with it, but there's a few that you really just need to work on that. And I'll continue to take points off if, it, if it's something I look at and I'm like, what is this, right? Sideways writing up the side of the page, you know, erased, cross through, you know, that sort of thing needs to be cleaned up. All right, now the homework question. What was, you had a question on? So we're looking at, uh, Separate it. Yes, absolutely. Yes. You can separate them as long as both of the pieces are defined on the interval. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. We will, yeah, we will have functions later where they're undefined in that interval, but we will still be able to talk about areas. Mm -hmm. You can do it that way also. You can split it or keep them. I'll do it both ways here. Okay, so which one, which one was it that, again, you wanted me to take a look at? 15? Okay. So the problem was integral 0 to 1, x to the 10th, plus 10 to the x, dx. Now, one of the questions that was just brought up and, and also in an email to me, is can you split this into two integrals? And the answer is yes, because the property of integral says if you have the sum or difference of two functions, you can split it into two. So that's one approach, or you could work with it all together. I'm going to split it just to illustrate the property. And now let's look at the first integral. The first integral is x raised to a power, right? The power being 10. So that looks like, if I take this integrand, it has the form here x to the n, right? The variable to a power. And we have a formula for that, to find the antiderivative. Now the other one here, 10 to the x, is not of the form x to the n. It's of the form a number to the variable, right? So if you look, 
in your formula sheet that I said was fair game now, right? If you look at the table of integrals and you look at number five for basic formulas, number five, it says that the antiderivative of a to the u du equals a to the u over natural log a plus c. Do you see that? Number five. This is reference page six. Reference page six. You see it? Okay. Now, that's why this problem is so important, is because it, it gives you the contrast between your variable to a power versus a number to a, your variable. The antiderivatives of those are completely different. Any questions on this? So now let me go ahead and, and do this. The first integral here, I'm going to find the antiderivative. What's the antiderivative of x to the 10th power? It's 1 over 11, x to the 11th, or you could put x to the 11th over 11. And then, the way we wrote it last class, you put that bar, and then you put your 0 and your 1, right? Then I'm going to say plus. Now the other one. According to this, it's 10 to the x over the natural log of 10. And then my bar, 0 to 1. Does everyone see that? The a is 10 in the problem. And the u is the x. And now it's just a matter of plugging in. So I'm going to do my first one here. My first one's going to give me two things subtracted. Then I'm going to do plus. The other one's going to be, give me two things subtracted. What do you get when you plug 1 in? 1 over 11? And we plug in 0? Zero? 0. Now on the other, other integral, or the other antiderivative, you plug 1 in. 10 to the first power is 10, right? 10 over ln of 10. And then 0, plug 0 in. 10 to the 0 is 1 over natural log 10. So we have 1 over 11. The 0 is gone. Plus 10 over natural log 10 minus 1 over natural log 10. And this, the, two, the second two terms are same denominator, right? So you can subtract the numerators. So you get, uh, what? 10 minus 1 is 9. So 9 over natural log 10. That's it. That's fine. This is good right here. That's an exact answer. Now, does that match the back of the book? It does? Sometimes in the back of the book, they'll do something a little different with the simplification, but it's the same answer. You could do that. You could, you know, but this would be 100% on a quiz or a test. Okay, any other questions on the homework? Yes, you could have you could have done the whole thing to start off, you know, here's your integral dx, not split it into two, and just gone straight to one over eleven x to the eleven plus uh what was it, ten to the x over natural log ten. Evaluate it from zero to one. No, you, you can do it either way. No. But you should be comfortable splitting it or leaving it. We will for the most part leave them. We won't split them up. Okay, what was the other one? 16. Let me see it first.
Where the heck is it? Cosecan squared? 17. Okay. Did, did someone say 16? Okay, but you're going to, oh yeah, you're withdrawing your request? Okay. So 17 is 0, 2 pi over 4, 1 plus cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta d theta. Hey, also everyone, keep in mind that starting with tonight's homework on, I should have the solutions to the homework problems on the website, right? There wasn't, there wasn't anything for, for this section, 5-3. But from 5-5 five, five on, all the homework problems that I've worked out, are, the answers are already there. So if I give you a homework assignment, look at my answers, try and resolve it like, like that first, and then, then we can talk about it in class. All right, so with this one, did I give you a hint on this one or not? No? Well, right now, up to this point, okay, unless you've seen some calculus uh, two before, done some antiderivatives and integration, we don't really have a way of dealing with a fraction yet like this. But we have to try something. So how about using the fact that we have two terms in the numerator and one in the denominator and split it into two? So split it like this. One over cosine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta. Now this is one option, okay? Also pointing out that we're using thetas instead of x's here, right? What is one over cosine theta, cosine squared theta? It's secant squared, isn't it? And then of course, cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta is just one. And do you have a formula on the formula sheets or do you remember something that when you take the derivative of it, you get secant squared? Tangent, right? And do you remember something that when you take the derivative of it, you get one? In this case, theta, right? If it, like the, we always say derivative of x is one. Derivative of theta in this case would be one. It reminds me of a story. Um, When I was what? Back when I was in grad school, for those of you who who plans to go do something beyond a bachelor's degree, graduate school, okay, you'll learn that graduate school is going to suck your life, all of your social life is going to go away. It's just going to be gone. It should be a good graduate program should should make you eat, sleep, everything, whatever you're doing, right? So what I had when I was in grad school is I had like one week, one night out of the whole month, I would go out, okay? I'd go, I was in my early 20s. I'd go out and I would just go crazy for one night, right? But I used to have this rule, you know, because I want to socialize with people, but, you know, I meet, I meet someone I like, I meet a girl or something. I have nothing to offer her, you know? There's, I have no time for you. That's just, so I used to have like this screen question, and the screening question was, what's the derivative of x? Right? That's it. That was like the minimum bar before we even talk anymore. That's what's the derivative of x, right? It's arrogant. It's stupid. I was young. It didn't matter, right? But I met this girl one time, and she answered me. She said, with respect to what variable? Because the derivative of x is 1 if x is the independent variable. But the derivative of x is not x, is not 1 if, it's a different, if you're differentiating with respect to something else, right? So I was like, hmm, you know, so anyway, <laughs> no, I didn't marry, but I kept in touch with her and she, uh, she wound up, I actually gave her like three more questions after that. And she like nailed each one of them. And I was like, each one of them was higher and higher level of math. And so this girl actually, she programs the robots that build cars. That's what she does. She goes into like a Ford plant and she sets up the programs for the robots and they just, they do all the welding and stuff. So she's a very bright girl. But the point is, back to this, when you say, where does one come from, you have to know what the variable was in the problem. And in this case, it's theta, right? 
So the antiderivative of one here is theta. With me? Okay. So let's go back to this now. Sorry. Tangent. The antiderivative of secant squared was tangent theta. And then plus theta, right? And then evaluate that from 0 to pi over 4. Which equals... So let's plug in and see what we get here. Tangent of pi over 4. 1. Okay. Plus... Plus... Not yet. I'm still plugging in the power of 4, right? So I've got to plug it in here and here. So tangent of power of 4 was 1, but then plus yeah. power of 4. And then minus tangent of 0, 0, plus 0 again. Y'all see this, right? I mean, okay. There, and then I'm doing it again here and here. All right, the blue is with the power of 4 in, and then the greenish one is the one with the 0. So what's our answer? 1 plus pi over 4. And I'm leaving it like this. This is an exact answer. Exact meaning there's no rounding, there's no approximation, no decimal. It's just the exact answer. Uh, yes, I was talking about two problems. I've done two problems out of the homework. Where's that stack of quizzes? Did they get around to everyone? Okay. Anyone else want to go through those and grab their stuff? All right, I'm ready to start today's stuff, okay? So we are going to jump right into 5-5 uh, five five now. Substitution. Now, here's where we are, just to kind of back up and take a look. We started the class with the idea of area in a circle. We said, oh, if we add up all the triangles forever, we get all this, we get the area. Then we did it with functions. We did the Riemann sums. We said limit, you know, n goes to infinity. Got this nasty formula, it was just disgusting. Then we got the fundamental theorem of calculus, which was great. And then we, thank you, we went with the... Uh, Antiderivatives last time, start talking about formulas and then, you know, all those tables in the back. And we gave you the power rule. The power rule was the first rule of how to find antiderivatives. Now we get into the next technique to help us find antiderivatives, and it's called substitution. The power rule you have to know how to use. At this point, I assume you can do power rule for days and, you, you know, you just nail it, okay? Substitution is another one of those rules you have got to get down. You will not proceed in this class if you don't get substitution down. So I will assign you a lot of problems from this section tonight. I encourage you to do every single one of them twice. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you've got to get this down. So to start with substitution, I'm going to go back to Cal 1 for just a second to talk about some stuff from Cal 1, one of the most important concepts of Cal 1, which is the chain rule. Now, you're all supposed to be familiar with the chain rule and experts, uh, maybe not experts in it, but feel comfortable with it. Um, being able to do substitution is going to be directly, it'll correlate directly to your ability to do chain rule. If you can do chain rule, substitution becomes easier. If chain rule is hard for you, substitution becomes very hard. So let's see if we can remember some chain rule. I'm going to start out with uh, sine x squared. Now, if I asked you to take the derivative of this, and I'm just going to use the prime notation for derivative. I know everyone's learned different ways of doing derivatives of, of uh, notation. But that means derivative of that composite function, right? This is a composite function, a function another, inside of another function. So we apply chain rule. Starting with the outside first, right? Derivative of sine of something is cosine, right? So cosine x squared times the derivative of what's inside the, the sine, which was 2x. That's it. Now we can move the 2x out front and all that, but that's it, right? Try another one. Natural log sine 
x squared. Okay, so you start with the outside natural log of something. What's derivative of natural log of something? One over it, right? So one over whatever was in the natural log, which what's in the natural log? Sine x squared. Then chain rule says times. Now go inside the natural log. What was in there? We just did this, right? Cosine of uh, sine of something. So derivative of sine of something is cosine. So no, just cosine of x squared, right? Th yes, coach. Next step. Next step. Times two x. The derivative of what was inside sine. Then you could put the cosine squared. I mean cosine x squared on top of the sine x squared. That could turn into cotangent x squared times 2x, right? How about this? How about negative 1 fourth square root 1 minus 4x squared? The one fourth? Yes, multiplied. So it's negative one fourth times that entire square root. So the negative one fourth out front, I'm just going to treat that like a constant. So I just bring it along, right? Just bring it along for the ride. Negative one fourth out here times. Now, what is the derivative of the square root of something? Okay, so there, that's why I asked. There's just different ways that people learn the derivative of the square root. Some people are taught to rewrite the square root as that in parentheses to the one half, and then bring the one half out and do that. That's, that's great if you're comfortable with that. I always teach my calculus classes that, look, we take the derivative of square root so much that you should just know that it's one over two root x. The derivative of square root of something is one over two times the root of that something. That, that, I think, should just be hardwired. Almost like the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. I mean, it's, it's like hardwired in there. The derivative of the square root of x should be one, 1 over 2 root x. That's what you would get if you did the 1 half and brought it out. And negative, you'd, you know what I'm saying? It would drop down. It's just much faster if you know it that way. So it'll be 1 over 2 times the square root of Whatever was in there, right? 1 minus 4x squared. Now the derivative of the inside of the square root, which would be negative 8x. Cancel the 8s and then the negatives and, and the 2. Everything, it actually cleans up pretty nice, doesn't it? So what do you get? x over square root of 1 minus 4x squared. Uh, that's it. Okay. My, my, my feeling sitting here is that a lot of you are okay with this. Now, I don't know if that's the feeling I should be getting up here or not. Um, try this one. <laughs> arc sine of tangent x. Now, I'll even say here, in my Cal 1 classes, I don't spend a whole lot of time on the arc, um, arc sine, arc tan, okay? But, but what I do tell my, tell my Cal 1 students is that you should know what the derivatives of these are. And they are on your formula sheet. If you don't know what the derivative of arc sine is, it's on reference page five. And starting with formula 19 down to 24 are all the derivatives of the inverse trig functions. So I'm not asking you to memorize these, but you should know. Some of them you should know. And you should kind of like, oh, I know it's going to involve this sort of pattern. So what is the reading off of 19? The derivative of arc sine of x 
is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, right? Off the formula. But for us, it's not arc sine of x, it's arc sine of tangent x. So using chain rule, the derivative would be 1 over square root 1 plus, but not x squared, tangent x squared. Was it minus? Minus, oops. Oh, sine, yeah. Uh, sine inverse. So minus tangent squared x. So we can write it like this. times the derivative of what was in there, deriv derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. Right? How about this? Hmm. Yes. That? Yeah. Okay. I don't know why. This is just tedious is what this one is. So what is the outside function? It's the square, it's the, the outside function is square root, right? So I'm gonna look at everything under here as like my x, right? That's like my x, so I have a square root of x. What's derivative of square root of x? One over two root x, but what's x for me? x plus root x plus root x, <laughs> right? Yes? Yeah. Times, now let me take the derivative of the yellow. Now be careful here because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get a set of parentheses, keep everything in order. What's the derivative of what's in the yellow? Well, first, what's the derivative of x? 1 plus, now, what's the derivative of the square root of this junk right here? It's all right. It's 1 over 2 square root of what was in there? x plus square root of x. But I'm not done with that piece. The derivative of what's in the green now. And that's going to be multiplied times the end of this. So what's the derivative of that? Another set of parentheses. 1 plus 1 over 2 root x. Close that parentheses, because I am done now, right? That's a derivative of the green. Where, where am I? This? No, hold on. One plus. The derivative of here is, is what we just did here, right? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Back up. The yellow, this is the, this is the derivative of the yellow right here, correct? That's my derivative of my yellow. And then, or sorry, the derivative of the square root. That's the derivative of the square root. Then the derivative of the yellow is here. But this part right here, I, I'm just trying to keep track of it all here. One plus, you're saying I need to take derivative of this right here? Is that not here? Hold on, let me get, where's my backup button? How many of you think this is the answer? How many of you think, no, no, because I, Everyone's telling me I need to keep going, but I'm not seeing where I need to keep going. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to see how many of you think I'm not done. Yes. Okay, I'm going to leave that right there. Okay, watch. This is one way you could do a problem like this to make it a little easier if it's, if it's just way out of control for you. All right, let me try this. Okay. I'm going to re rewrite the problem. The first thing I have is square root of u. All right? 
Now, then everything in the yellow is U, right? So U is equal to what? U is equal to X plus the square root of X plus the square root of X, right? Now, why don't I call this right here, I'm just going to call it V. Just, just bear with me for a second. What's V then? Square root of X plus the square root of X, right? A little more room here. And I think that's enough for me to be happy with. I'm going to come up to this top one and just call this one up here Y. What is the derivative of Y? Come up here, what's the derivative of Y? 1 over 2 root u, right? And that's it, right? That's the derivative of y with respect to u. Okay, what is the derivative of u? 1 plus, well, 1 plus, all that green stuff I'm calling what? V, right? So isn't it V prime? Okay, what's V prime? 1 over 2 square root of x plus root x times, now the derivative of what's inside? 1 plus 1 over 2 root x, right? Pardon me? I did, that's this right here. That's it right there. This right here, I took the derivative of the square root of something is 1 over 2 times it, right? That's this. Now the derivative of what's inside of that root, which is 1 plus, now the derivative of the square root of x, which is the 1 over 2 root x. But that is my derivative. That is my derivative. I'm not taking my derivative of my derivative again. No? My derivative is of the square root of x. And the derivative of the square root of x is 1 over 2 root x. So let me try and put this back together. Is what, what is this right here? That right there, isn't that this part? Yes? Right? Because u is all that crap right there. So it's 1 over 2. And isn't this one right here, that one right there? And isn't V prime all of this? And isn't that this? Sorry, but I'm done. I mean, that was done, okay? All right. I, I'm just trying to get, when I said, okay, is that, I felt like everyone wanted me to keep going, and I didn't see where we were keeping going. This is a good exercise of chain rule. We won't have to do quite this much backwards, fortunately for us. <laughs> All right, thanks for, thanks for the exercise. My, my, brain, my brain is fried now. All right, let's try something else now. Um, I had one in my head here. Uh, this will be, we're kind of getting to the end of, of what I want to do. Um, how about... Tangent inverse of E to the T. What's the derivative of this? So what's the derivative of arctangent of something? 1 over 1 plus... So it'll be e to the t squared, which I'll turn into e to the 2t next, times now the derivative of what was inside the arctangent, which is e to the t, which turns into e to the t over 1 plus e to the 2t. 
Now the 2t I just got by going e to the t squared, 2 times t. That's it. That's it. Yeah. All right. We ready for substitution now? Okay. Here we go. Now, substitution. Remember, what we're trying to do now is find antiderivatives. Go backwards, right? I give you an integral. You're supposed to say, oh, that comes from where, right? So here's, here's the way I've always approached it. What I tell my students you know, when they're looking at these, when you're looking at an integral, if it's not directly off your formula sheet, if it's not a power rule, like, you know, x to the 10th, where it's just one, you know, you do that, it's 1 11th, x to the 11th. If it's not that simple, then you've got to do something. Substitution, what I would say is do this. Look at the integrand. Okay, look at it. Dot, dot, dot. So you're sitting there going, hmm, you're thinking. Do you see something? Yes, of course you see something. Do you see something and its derivative? Do you see something and its derivative? That's the question you'll ask. Hopefully you do. If you don't, try something, okay? That means don't quit. You've got to try something. You're hoping to see something in its derivative, but if not, you've got to try something. So I'm going to start with an example. I want the antiderivative of x sine x squared. And let's make it 2x. We're going to start off like baby steps here. The what? How you what? Okay, so step back, step back, take a look. It's not a simple power rule, right? Bless you. And it's, it's not a formula because our formula sheet can handle sine, can't it? But it doesn't handle sine of x squared. It only sine of the variable and we're good. Plus we have those two things multiplied. So we, we can't split this into part, right? Like this is a huge no-no. You can't do 2x dx times integral, what is it, sine x squared? You cannot do that. Okay, I see that. That's like, out of 10 points, that's zero points if you do something like that. So the only other thing I have is to try and look for something in its derivative. What do you see? You see something and its derivative sitting there? 2x. Which is the derivative of which? That's what I want you to see. Okay. So you see that the derivative of x squared is 2x. So you saw something. Here it is. And you saw its derivative sitting over here. That's what you need for substitution. And that's where we start. Everyone see something as derivative? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a substitution. I'm going to substitute something in the problem with something else. And we normally use the letter u. I let u be equal to the thing that you saw. Not its derivative, but the thing that you saw. The first thing. The thing that wasn't differentiated, right? The x squared. That all right? Okay. Now, once you let u be that thing, differentiate that equation. Implicitly with respect to x. What the hell does that mean? That means I'm going to take du dx, so the derivative of u with respect to x on the left side, and then what's the derivative of x squared with respect to x? Just 2x, right?
Is that okay? Now what I'm going to do, and, and this substitution is taught different ways. This is the way I do it. I don't know. It makes most sense to me this way. I like to just take that dx and put it on the other side, like kind of like multiplying both sides by dx. And that way you get du equals 2x dx. Now watch what happens here. I've highlighted the yellow, right? The yellow there, u is the yellow. But do you see down here that the 2x dx matches up with the 2x dx here? And that's all multiplication, isn't it? So I could like rearrange things. Let me rearrange the integral. You don't have to rearrange it, but I'm just gonna show you how this will work. If I rearrange it sine x squared, and then I put the 2x dx at the back like this, then I have an exact match here and here, don't I? Got it? Now, at this point, we are going to rewrite the integral. So instead of putting an equal sign, what I will use is an arrow to symbolize that I'm going to a new integral using my substitution. Rewrite this integral in terms of u now. So what is x squared for us? Careful, what is x, yeah, x squared is u, right? So I'm gonna rewrite this integral sine, not x squared, but u, right? Yes? And what is 2x dx for us? It's du, isn't it? And now your new integral, sine u du, you can go directly to the formula for on, in the back, right? Negative cosine u, right? So this equals negative cosine u plus a constant. See, because we're taking, we're doing a, what do we call it when we're doing an integral where we don't have numbers on it? That's called a indefinite, indefinite integral. So anytime we do an indefinite integral, we always have to have plus c. Are we done? We got to plug things back in, right? So you've got to get u's back to x's now. But that should be pretty simple, because what was u? X squared. And that's it. Now, the good news about this is that with finding antiderivatives, you can always check your work by taking the derivative. If you take the derivative of that and apply the chain rule, you should get back the integrand, 2x sine 2x squared, right? Do you all see how that works? As you might ima imagine, they aren't going to stay that easy. Okay, let me try something like... Here's, here's something that trips people up. Cosine pi theta d theta. Now, if that was just cosine theta d theta, you could go straight to your formula, couldn't you? But the pi is throwing it off. Agreed? Um, you can't pull the pi out of cosine, right? So let's try substitution. Do you see something and its derivative? Hmm. If pi is a constant, what would the derivative of pi theta be? It'd just be pi. We don't have a pi, but we're off by a constant. So this is one of those ones where you look and you're like, you don't see something in its derivative just sitting there, right? But you got to try something. So let's start with the inside part of the composite function, the inner piece, pi theta. And let's just choose that to be u. Let's just try it. See what happens. I'm going to let u be equal to pi theta. Now I'm going to take the derivative with respect to which variable? Theta. So du d theta will equal, what's the derivative of pi theta? Just pi. Is that okay? It's like me asking you what the derivative of 4x is with respect to x, you'd say 4. 
Now I always like to multiply both sides by the denominator, pi theta, d theta. Is that okay? Now let me try and match things up. I have a d theta up there, don't I? And I have a d theta here. But I don't have a pi d theta, do I? So, but this is an equation. So why don't I divide both sides of this equation by pi? Couldn't I do that? And I'm not really going to divide. I'm actually going to multiply by 1 over pi. Same thing. So what this means to me is this. I know that I can take that pi theta, the yellow, and I can replace it with u, right? And I also know that I can take the d theta in the back and replace it with what? what? One over pi du, right? So let me rewrite this integral. So I'm using an arrow. It's, it becomes cosine of u times 1 over pi du. Questions on that? Sure. What can I do with that 1 over pi? It's a constant. It can come out of the integral, right? We talked about that before. So 1 over pi integral cosine u du. And now you have a formula for cosine u. Yes. For 1 over u. Well, if that was a 1 over u, you couldn't you would have to go try and find the antiderivative. You, you wouldn't be able to, because it would be cosine u times natural log u. You can't split that into two integrals and do antiderivative of cosine, antiderivative of one over u. You know what I'm saying or no? You're saying if that one over pi was a one over u. You, you, yes, I agree. The antiderivative of one over u by itself is natural log of u. But with the cosine u in front of it, you couldn't just do each one individually. Well, stay tuned. Yeah, we'll do something like that. Yeah. Well, for that, we'll probably use integration by parts, which we haven't talked about yet. Yes? Uh, no, it's, that's a great question. We have changed our problem to, from thetas to u's, haven't we? But now we've got to go back from u's back to thetas. So I'm not done because I have to replace my u with what? Pi theta. So my answer, my final final answer, will be 1 over pi sine pi theta plus c. OK? Any questions on that? These trig functions like this come up a lot. So I want to show you a general formula. And we're going to we're going to derive it first and then we're going to just come up with some formulas. So here it is. A lot of times you'll have something like this. Like cosine which you know the antiderivative of cosine, right? Sine. But inside of it you don't have just x, you'll have like some number in front of x like ax, like we just had pi, right? And then you'll have maybe plus b, where b is some other number, dx. So here, just so you know, a and b are numbers. What would the antiderivative of this be? Well, I'm going to use I'm going to use this. I'm going to take a substitution. I'm going to let my substitution u be equal to ax plus b. What's the derivative? of u with respect to x. So just a, right? Just a? Because b is a constant, derivative of a constant, 0. Multiply both sides by the dx.
Is that all right? Now again, I have my a plus, ax plus b. That's going to be swapped out for a u. But what about my dx? I need to swap it out. So I have dx over here. I need to get that a out of there. So 1 over a, right? Multiply 1 over a. So I have 1 over a du equals dx. That good? So my dx can be replaced now with 1 over a du. Let me rewrite the integral. So here's my arrow. This integral becomes cosine u times 1 over a du. What can I pull out of there? 1 over a is a constant coming out of the integral. Integral cosine u du. Antiderivative of cosine, sine u plus a constant. And finally, u. What is u? 1 over a sine of ax plus b, right? Plus a constant. Yes? Now, we do have one condition here on A. What's the condition on A? Can't be 0. Because if we had 0, it would be undefined, right? It can't be 0. Hmm? For, you're saying if you've ran into this later, you wouldn't need to go through all these steps? This, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get you to be, where you just do it automatically. So look, it, it, now let me give you an example. If I say, what's the antiderivative of cosine of 3x plus 7? So before you give me the answer, hold on. When you look at that, you say, I know the antiderivative of cosine, right? It's sine. But what's inside of that is linear. It's a linear expression, right? Linear meaning it has x to the first power and then a constant. Anytime you have your trig function with a linear expression in it, what you're guaranteed is that the antiderivative will be 1 over what? The a, the number in front of the variable. And then sine of the linear expression plus a constant. And what you want to get to is the point where it's just automatic like that where you're not even referring to the formula, all you're saying is, look, all I know, I mean, when I look at that, I know that, look, I'm going to be off by that three. So I need to come in with a one-third to kill it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Now, this extends to all the other trig functions. So let's look at this example. What would the antiderivative of sine of... 2 pi x plus 1b. So do you know the antiderivative of sine? It's negative cosine. What's inside there? 2 pi x plus 1. Is it linear? So your a is 2 pi, so you're off by that. So negative 1 over 2 pi cosine 2 pi x plus 1 plus c. Does this apply to the inverse as well? No. Well, what do you mean to the inverse? To the inverse trig functions? No. This will also work for the antiderivative secant squared. See if I can trick you. Do you know the antiderivative of secant squared? Tangent, right? But it's secant squared of a linear expression. The a, though, is negative 2. So you need to come in here with negative 1 half. 
what? Tangent of 1 minus 2x plus c. So let me highlight the a's here. See, those are my 1 over a's right there. All right, it's a long way to go. Uh, another integral. This problem is where we're headed, okay? It's not obvious. This is not Cal 1. It's not where you have the product rule, right? Here's the rule. Do it. This, derivative of this, times this, plus derivative. Okay? That's, that's mechanical. That's monkey see, monkey do, right? That's the type of math that is. This, this math, okay, getting this requires repeated effort. You don't get it the first time, things start get ugly, start over. Start over. It's, it's persistence that will get you good at this. And eventually with time, you'll start to see it before you start doing the problem. Now, I know two people, at least two people got it. But I'd like to see, or three people, I'd like to ask the people who got it, how they got it. So who wants to tell me Okay, you start looking at the denominator. Yes, okay. Okay, let me make sure everyone's hearing that because you're projecting this way. So you looked at the denominator and you said, you look, well, you looked at 2x and you said, where does that come from? That's the derivative of x squared. I don't have x squared, but you then did what? Right? So he, he's noticing that even though he doesn't have x squared, x to the fourth is x squared squared. Right? Now, I agree with you, and, and that's going to get us there. And how did you see it? Same way, right? Now, why did you see it that way? See, that, I, no one, I can't answer. So the, for people who are sitting here going, well, how would I have ever thought? I don't know. Okay, I don't have that answer for you. The only way you get to the point where you see that is just by looking and keep looking and then eventually it's there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for give me give me step A, B, C, D to get to the answer. This course we will not work this way. It has to be where you're just like, you know, maybe you walk away and you, t you, you drink a couple of beers and come back. Ah, oh, I got it. Now I see it. You, it's that type of thing where you might struggle with a problem for hours and then the switch flips. Does nature okay? find, what, find the derivative of something within this and then try to figure out how that derivative of something like this? Well, one approach was to look at, hey, 2x, I know that's the derivative of x squared. If I could just see an x squared somewhere. Yeah. Now, let me show you where the way I would have, like, I'm trying to be like, at a place where I haven't done thousands of these before, I might just, if I don't see something right off the bat, I might have said, let me just try u equals the entire denominator, right? Try it. If I take the derivative of that, I get what, 4x cubed? I don't have 4x cubed anywhere, do I? So that would automatically start making me think, Maybe that's not the good approach, okay? Unless I had a, an x cubed somewhere there. And I've already eliminated this. Do you see by making the substitution that that's u? 
The only thing left for me to work with now is the 2x dx, and I've got a 4x cubed. That's going to be very difficult to try and make this thing match up down here. Do you all understand what I'm saying? Hmm? No? It, I've got to make the 2x dx somehow come out of this. How can I do that when I've got x cubed? You see? So if I were doing this problem, I would say to myself, nah, probably need to start over. Okay? Probably just need to start over and try something else. So then maybe it's, okay, 2x is the derivative of x squared. So how about I just rewrite the problem? 2x over 1 plus x squared squared dx. Right? That's true. And now let me make a substitution. u is equal to x squared. Then the derivative of that will be what? 2x. Now watch the way I write this. I'm going to write 2x dx. So I've skipped the step where I make the left side du dx and then brought the dx up. I, I just do that all in one step. That's my normal protocol. But do you all understand what I did? Okay. Now, do I have a 2x dx? Exactly, don't I? I don't even have to move anything around. 2x dx is right here. And u is right there. Well, yeah, u is right there. Well, I'm going to rewrite this now. It's integral. What is the what is the 2x dx up there going to be replaced with? Du over 1 plus the u squared. Any questions on that? Which equals integral. I'm going to move the du out to the right side. And you should have this in your formulas. Yep, this is the antiderivative of arctangent. So I would become familiar with I would become familiar with all the formulas 1 through 20. At least 1 through 20 on reference page 6 cuz they come up so often. You want to almost see them. You almost want to be trying to get your integral to that point so that you can apply the formula. So it's formula 17. It's formula 17 with A being what for us? 1. With A being 1. So the antiderivative of this is arctangent of what? U plus C. Which equals... Now, arctangent, replace your u. What's u? x squared. x squared plus c. Excellent. So, can I make that needs to be in your bag of tricks. Okay, because a lot of this is a bag of tricks. So, in your bag of tricks, you have rewrite it and try and make it look, you know, but that's just one trick. You've got a bunch of them that you're going to have to be able to pull out. Um, but do you see the essence of what this is about? It's not, there's a lot of gray area here and there's a lot of just, you know, just, you got to figure it out and you can't, I can't teach that to you. I can tell you how I learned it. I learned it by doing every single problem in the book that I could it's funny, I've gone back and looked at my Cal 2 stuff, and I did every single problem. Almost all of them are wrong. But I tried them, you know, like I kept going at it. I kept going, kept trying, kept trying. Eventually, it starts to click, okay? But if you just get to and say, uh, oh, yeah, I see it. I could do that if I, if I needed to. That's not going to do it. And if you, um, if you look at it and quit, it's not going to work either. So hopefully you'll take my advice and you'll put the time in. I don't recommend that you just pull out my solutions and say, oh, yeah, I see how he did that. That's easy. Because it's the seeing how to do that is the hard part. Making the correct substitution.
Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, if, if there was like a, a rule I could give you, man, I'd, I'd love to, to give that rule to you. Like, this will always work, you know? But it just, the problem is it won't, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Mm, let's do this. Dang it. I'm trying to make this somewhat doable, but somewhat challenging. No, I'm going to help you with this one. Or you're going to help me. Do you see something and its derivative? What? I agree that cosine is derivative of sine, but exactly is the derivative of sine of 1 over x, cosine of 1 over x. Not exactly because of chain rule, right? Go a little simpler then. Is there something else in there you see and its derivative? X squared. X squared. There's a lot of things in here, right? That may get you there. There's a lot of wrong things that could, you're just going to get stuck. So let me help you because that's what I'm here to try and do for the hour and 40 minutes we're here. You're going to you're have to go home and suffer yourself through these things. But while I'm here, let me try and force your eyes to see. Do you see the 1 over x? Do you see what the derivative of 1 over x is? Negative 1 over x squared, isn't it? Isn't that the derivative? Of, isn't it? Y'all agree? With, yeah? Yeah, but don't you see right here that this is actually a 1 over x squared times cosine 1 over x over the sine of 1 over x plus 1? So that x squared that was sitting in the denominator there is, is actually a 1 over x squared, isn't it? If you kind of peel it off the front. Yeah? I'm missing my dx. Come back down here, bottom left side. I forgot my dx. So do we have something in its derivative? Yes, but we're off by a little bit, aren't we? This one's negative. What's up there is what? Positive. So... Just, just do uh, divide both sides by negative 1 here. So make this line negative 1 du equals 1 over x squared dx. Now let me kind of highlight the things that, that are going to match. My 1 over x's, all my 1 over x's are going to be replaced by what? U's. All of my, well, my 1 over, oop, wrong color. So parenthesis. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you for correcting me on that. Hold on. 1 over x dx. Let me highlight that. On the denominator on the right side, I, I put my parenthesis in the wrong place. It should be right here like this, right? That okay? That's all right to write that way because I have a big dot between those, so I'm separating the fractions. Yeah. I want to make sure there's no questions here. Do we have any questions on the things that are going to be replaced? All my 1 over x's are going to be replaced with what? Use my blue 1 over x squared dx is going to be replaced with negative du or negative 1 du. Right? 
all the blue stuff. So here I go. Integral. I'll put the negative in the back. Cosine u over sine u plus 1 times negative 1 du. I don't like the negative. I'm going to pull that out. Negative in front of the integral. Cosine u over sine u plus 1 du. Now what? Now what? We know what the antiderivative of cosine is. We know the anti but they're it's separated in a fraction. So we can't just go straight to antiderivative of each one. Why not? Do you see something in its derivative again? The derivative of cosine is negative sine, right? The derivative of sine is cosine. So which one do you use for u? The, the, the rule of thumb is to try and pick the most, the more complicated of the two, and you want to pick the, the most you possibly can. And, and you never want your derivative to wind up in your denominator. Okay, so like, let me just show you, don't write this down. Let me just say that I pick my, and I can't use u again, can I? No. I have to use a different variable. So we usually use v. If I pick my v to be cosine u, then dv will be what? Negative sine u du. Do you have a negative sine u du? Well, your sign's down in the denominator. And in all the formulas in the back of the book, the du is not in the denominator. It's along the side, right? Which means it's on top. So you do not want to ever choose your, your substitution so that your denominator or your derivative winds up denominator. So let me try something else. Let me try sine u. But let's go even further. Can't we do sine u plus 1? Just pick the whole denominator. Because the derivative of that is still going to be the cosine u. So dv will be cosine u du. Questions on my choice of v, not u, choice of v, and how I got dv. So I'm going to replace sine u plus 1, all of that with what? v. I'm going to replace cosine u du, which I have exactly, don't I? With what? dv. So my new integral becomes negative integral 1 over v dv. Sometimes my v's look like r's. So... Right? What's the antiderivative of 1 over v dv? It'll be natural log, right? And then we have the negative out front. So negative natural log absolute value v plus a constant. That, yeah, that was a formula though, right? The 1 over v, everyone should be comfortable with the antiderivative 1 over v. But now what was v? Then what was u? That's it.
I remember when I was when I was in Cal two doing this. I was uh, I remember sitting down, laying down on the carpet in my apartment on the floor with a big bottle of wine and just going at it, man, for hours and hours, just trying, trying, and trying. And but the thing is, it, it, there's the reward also. You know, there's the reward when you when you can get the solution. I mean, that's that's part of why some of us are in this field, right? With math in it, because as challenging as it is, when it does click, when it does, when you finally do get it, there's a little bit of a kind of good feeling, right? <laughs> it was sparkling uh, grape juice or something like that. I don't, know. not real wine. Yeah. All right. Well, as you might imagine, I could go all day with things like this. Um, so, could you follow up a little bit? Do what? Oh, up. Yes. Okay, good question. This right here is really x to the negative 1. And then when I take its derivative, it's negative 1x to the negative 2, which is negative 1 over x squared. Yeah? Hey, look, like I said, the better you are taking derivatives the better you are doing this because you see that backwards right like you see now that I've shown you this problem you saw the 1 over x squared there if you knew 1 over x squared is the derivative of 1 over x well negative 1 over x squared is derivative of 1 over x then that would have been a little easier for you to recognize right uh, let's do this um, hmm All right, let's go x sine square root x squared plus 1 over square root x squared plus 1 dx. Let u be the whole square root? What do y'all think of that? Or the u is just the x squared plus 1? Either one will work. But does it seem like, let's, let's start, we'll go kind of like incremental through this. If I'm looking for something in its derivative, I see that x is the derivative of x squared, right? I'm off by a constant, right? Because really, 2x is derivative of x squared. But you can always be off by a constant because you can always come through and divide both sides and, and move that constant around. That's OK. So y'all got me? It's always all right to be off by a constant. So I see the x. I see the x squared. The question is, if I'm going to make a substitution, should I grab just x squared or should I try and grab the x squared plus 1 also? x squared plus 1, grab the whole thing because the derivative of that is the same as the derivative of x squared. So grab, like that's what I was saying, grab as much as you can without grabbing too much. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> du is 2x dx, right? Are y'all kind of falling in line here with my notation, the way I'm doing this? Okay. Exactly. So I, I'm trying to match things up now. I've got my x squared plus 1. I know all of those are going to be replaced with u's. 
I've got my, let me see. Oh, I actually up here have an x dx, right? And I have x dx here, so I just need to divide both sides by 2. So 1 half du equals x dx. I use an arrow to rewrite the integral. I have sine what? Root sine root u over root u. And then what's the x dx? One half du. I don't like the one half in there, so I'm going to take it out. You should never be working on a problem where you've got u's and du's and x's and dx's all mixed up together. Once you go to a new integral, everything should be the same variable, all u's, okay? Well, we still have something kind of ugly here. So maybe try again. Do you see something in its derivative? Okay, you want to try square root of u? Why? It's 1 over 2 root u. Yeah, so I already have a root 2 on the bottom, do I? don't I? So to, to help you see this, I'm going to just rewrite the original problem just to, just to kind of help you see that. That problem is really that, right? So if square root of u, the derivative of that is 1 over 2 root u, I have 1 over root u, I'm off by 2, I'm, I'm okay. I do have it in front, so if I were smart, I would bring it back in, right? Either way, it would work. I'm going to act like that one half was a one seventh, so I wouldn't be able to do that, and I'm just going to work with what I've got inside. So I'm going to make my substitution, and I'm going to use W instead. And the only reason I'm using W is because sometimes my Vs look like Rs. So I'm just trying a different variable. There's, we have no, no discrimination here against what variable to use. Uh, we'll, we'll wind up using U, V, W x, you know, all sorts of things. That's going to be what? Square root u. Now what is my next line? dw equals 1 over 2 root u du. Good. I have the 1 over u, root u du, I have it right there, 1 over root u du. I don't have the 2 down there, so let me get, at, get it out of there. So I'll do what? Multiply both sides by 2. So 2 dw equals 1 over root u du. Yes. Yeah, that's what we were just saying. You could have taken the 2 that was out there and put it back in, but... I was treating the problem like, like that were something that wasn't that nice. Like, let's say it was a one-fifth, then you couldn't just okay. drop it back in there. It's going to wind up canceling out, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm ready to rewrite the integral. Unless there's a question. Does anyone have a question? Um, one-half. Integral. Sine what? I'm replacing the square root u with v or w, depending on what you used in your work. Then I'm replacing all that 1 over root u du with 2 dw. The 1 half in front cancels with the 2 when I bring it out. Integral sine w dw. What's the antiderivative of sine? Negative cosine w plus a constant. So, so we're actually there. We just need to get everything back in terms of, uh, what was our original variable? X, right? Any questions where I got any of this? Yep. What was w? So you can go back up. You can do this slowly. 
it's square root of u. But what was u? When you, great question, great, great question. I always forget this. Right here, this dw, when you take an antiderivative, the dw is basically gone. So it vanishes. Think about, about it the other way. When you go from something to its derivative, the dw appears, it's usually one, isn't it? But see how it's not one anymore? Look at what dw is for us. dw is this. So dw now has a value to it. But once you get everything in terms of w, it's, it's, it's like it was a 1 to begin with. But that's why you have to switch back at the end all the way back. W goes back to u in terms of u and then in terms of x. And you could check this. You all see how I'm making these problems, right? I'm just sitting up here and I'm creating a function in my head and I'm differentiating it and then I'm just putting it down, right? And then having us re reverse engineer it. Okay, we are, we're out of time. Can you believe it? I mean, I'm sorry. Sorry to disappoint you. Here's your homework. 5.5, page 306. All right, one through six. I'm going to start this up here. Page 306, 1 through 6. Those problems, they give you the integrals, and they tell you what substitution to make. So they say, let u be whatever, to kind of get you to get that feeling of, okay, here's the substitution, work it out, right? Then from 7 on, they don't give you anything. So what I recommend you do is 1 through 6, all of them. And then for, for next new week, you should do at least 7 through 51 odd. The odds have the answers in the back of the book. I will say that, okay, at 37, that's where they split. 7 up to 35 are all indefinite integrals, where you're going to have some function plus c. From 37 to 51... It's definite integral. So not only do you have to find the antiderivative, you then have to go evaluate it at two endpoints and get a numerical answer. But all of these problems, every single one of them requires substitution. When you're done with all this homework, which, you know, this will probably take you until next Tuesday, I would, I would try and tackle all the evens if I were you. Even problems. If, if I were, you know, my best recommendation for this section would be if you can do 1 through 52, all, I think you're, you're ready for, to move on. So you have a lot of homework. I intend on having a quiz. I know I said that last time, but now I've got some stuff I can really give you a quiz on. I mean, imagine you walk in on Tuesday, and I give you a substitution problem, and I give you 10 minutes. You're either going to see it or you're not, right? So the more practice you have, the better you're going to be at seeing that substitution. Have a good weekend even though I just ruined it.